Hello everybody, welcome to the channel. I'm so happy you're here today. This is gonna be a very, like we're jumping right into it. We're gonna be talking about pivotal weather. We're just going through the site. It's a walkthrough. It's what I've been promising for a while. So I come through, I fulfill my promises. Subscribe, do that thing because I am really excited about the things we have coming up on the channel. But without further ado, let's get right into it. Let's talk about pivotal weather. Now, first off, this guide is for beginners, intermediate folks. If you're an advanced power user of weather modeling websites, pivotal weather in particular, this may not have a lot of stuff for you. That's a just disclaimer right there. If you are a power user, there's a lot of really great uh, videos we have on the channel. It's on the playlist. That card just popped up. So check that out. So the first thing you're going to need to know about Pivotal Weather are the different model types available. You can see it right here in the top left hand corner. You can see my mouse going right to it. And I am going to click on that and you can see all the different models that are available for you to use. You see it's, you have global, you have regional, convective, convection allowing ensembles. Now let's talk about what all of those mean. Global models, they are exactly what they sound like. They are run globally. They are literal global models. They forecast weather across the entire globe. On Pivotal Weather, you have the Euro, uh, the Euro high res. Everybody uses the Euro high res versus the Euro, just so you know, just getting that out there. Uh, you have the GFS, you have the GDPS, which is the Canadian. Then you have the UK Met, which is the British model. And then up there at the top, you also have the CFS. Now, a little thing about the CFS is it is a climate model. It's uh, designed to forecast well in advance. In fact, uh, let's go right over to it and I'll just show you that for a second. You can see it goes to hours out to hour 768. I'm shooting this video on Saturday, September 24th. So it, we're probably a month later at this point. I don't know when this video is coming out, but let's see. Uh, we're going to look and the forecast is actually for a month from now, October 26. The CFS here says there's going to be a giant ridge over the western U.S. Will that happen? Well, it's a long way away. We don't know if that's actually going to happen. That's a that's a long way away. So but the CFS is there. It's useful in some say, uh, cases if you're trying to like anticipate patterns. But we're going to get into a better option for that here in just a second. So. Let's take a look at uh, the regional tabs, the regional. What is regional weather models? Regional weather models are run across specific regions. In this case, you have the NAM and the RAP, which are focused on the US because they are American models. And you have the RDPS, which is a Canadian model, regional model as well. Uh, a lot of people, th these models have tended to fall out of favor with a lot of folks. They don't look at them as much. I love it. I love the NAM. I love the RAP. The SPC meso-analysis we talked about in a previous video is actually based on the wrap. Uh, its data comes from the wrap. So just so you know, uh, I find these models immensely useful. You can see the wrap goes out to 21 hours. The NAM here goes out to 84 hours. So you're talking about shorter term uh, models as well. That's what these regional models are. Uh, you know, you can look at the RDPS. Obviously you can, it covers America, etc. But I, I don't use it, it's there. It's a great option if that's what you're looking for. So let's go over to the convection allowing models. Uh, just, just uh, we've talked about this in our introduction to models video, but basically you start out with the global models, which have these very uh, broad resolutions. I think they're 12 kilometers, nine kilometers, that sort of thing. So it's modeling in uh, atmosphere in nine to 12 square kilometer type of areas. And that's how it's getting its data. That's what it's outputting. Uh, then you have the NAM, the RAP, which are a little bit smaller. And then you have the convection allowing models, which can get down to about three kilometers, which is a big deal. Uh, the, that, so all these are very fine scale models. You have the HRRR, the NAM three kilometer uh, CONUS. You have the HRW, WRF, ARW. That is a lot. Uh, then you have the H, I'm, do I even need to say it? But you have these models uh, and they all typically, since they're so high resolution, don't run more than about 60 hours out. 
the FE3 and the NAM three kilometer run about 60 hours out or run 60 hours out. The both the HRWs run 48 and then the HRRR runs 18 hourly and then four times a day will run out to 48 hours. Now, what's the difference? Let's take a look at the model output for each of these and you'll, and you'll see it. So let's go to the GFS 500 millibar chart. You can see the, uh, you can see the data is a little bit smooth. It's smooth. That's the best way to put it. That's the word I'm looking for. It is smooth. And that is because it's modeling things on a broader scale. You take a look at the NAM, both of these models are pretty broad scale. Now, when you go to, let's just say the NAM three kilometer, you see there's a little bit more detail there. It's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more detail. It's not as smooth the data is. And that's because you have more resolution to look at. So those are the, what, those are the main weather models uh, you would use for forecasting data. You also have ensembles. I love ensembles. Ensembles are amazing. And you want to use ensembles when you're forecasting seven, eight, nine more days out, they are going to be a lot better. An ensemble model is a collection of models. So it's, so basically you take the GFS, you take like 18, 20, 30 versions of it, and you throw it, the average into one model. And that's the data you get out. That's a lot better when it comes to forecasting patterns days in advance. Uh, but you'll notice when you go over to the ensembles, there are nowhere near as many products here on the left. That's just how it is, especially on Pivotal Weather, that's just how it is. These are still amazing tools. Personally, I'm a big fan of the 500 millibar height anomaly on the ensemble models. Uh, you can check that out. You, you also have the Euro, you have the Canadian, you have the SREF, and you have the National Weather Service blend of models. By the way, if you are looking for high temperature forecasts, please use the blend of models. Just do it. You'll be thankful. So let's take a look at some of the options you have available very quickly. Let's run across it. First off, you have zooms. Uh, your zooms go from anywhere from uh, continental. So if you want to take a look at different continents, say you're a user in Africa, you can look and you can see the data from that continent. So uh, we're, we, you know, we obviously target America. That's our target audience. But if you are an international user, you're watching this, you want to use Pivotal Weather, there are zooms available for you with the global models, especially. Uh, you also have uh, tropical zoom. So it is hurricane season right now. There are a lot of storms out there right now. You also have uh, national zooms. Uh, so let's just zoom back in here to the US. You also have regional zooms. Uh, which are available in the US and Canada. This includes things like uh, multi-state, these are basically multi-state zooms. And then lastly, you have, if you are a subscriber to Pivotal Weather Plus, you have local zooms. If you are forecasting weather pretty locally, regionally, et cetera, you have that available and you can take a look at the uh, forecast for say here in Northeast Texas. Usually it's by state, larger states are broken up a little bit. so. All these options are available as settings. You also have uh, different animation options from forecast loop, forecast slideshow, forecast GIF. I'm not gonna name them all. These are available on all the larger zooms. All of them are, so such as model trend, etc. Great options. I explore them for sure. Definitely explore them. Pivotal weather is also awesome because when you have the forecast loop up, which you can click and drag if you so choose, but I'm not, I'm not about that life. I am a person who uses the hotkeys uh, for the next and previous. Uh, you can see it right here, this box, loop keys, that is uh, the key shortcut, keyboard shortcut for that. My goodness, I was having trouble saying that. Uh, and then you have all the other hotkeys. You can actually go to previous run, next run, if you want to, which is really nice uh, if you're trying to compare uh, model trends, especially on something like the HRRR short term. And then you also have uh, different options over here on the far right. So you have several settings available for you to use on Pivotal Weather. It's a great amount. Now, I just wanna take a little bit of time to talk about some products that I think you should have bookmarked. Let's go for it. Now, the first product that I definitely want to tell you to check out that you should have bookmarked on your favorite spar, whatever, would be your favorite model and reflectivity and updraft holicity all in one. 
this is like a favorite of storm chasers, I'm going to admit. Uh, you can see here, uh, you can see some uh, storms forming around here in Texas. Oh, there's some more. Uh, if these storms are spinning, if they have some updraft to listy, you will see a little swath pop up on there. Uh, unfortunately, if you look across the country right now, there's none to be found. So it's, it's kind of hard to show that feature off right now, which I apologize for. Oh, let's hop over here to Arkansas just to see if uh, there will be some. Uh, yeah, no. Oh, there was a little bit. If you take a look right here in Arkansas, you can see just right there, just a little bit of an updraft helicity swath. If this storm is spinning hard, you'll see a lot more of that, at least modeled spinning hard. You'll see a lot more of that. I'm a big fan of this. Uh, there's a joke going on uh, around like weather Twitter that talks about how, you know, people just post up draft to listy maps, chase for those. It's true, you don't wanna do that, but updraft to listy is a nice product to have overlaid with your reflectivity. Now, if you're a storm chaser on the go, you're in a hurry and you're wanting a quick look at like, is there environments, are there environments on these models for supercells, for severe weather, in the next couple of weeks. I go to Supercell Composite. It's kind of a cheat. It kind of combines several ingredients that would make an environment favorable for severe weather, especially the kind storm chasers are looking for. And so I like the Supercell Composite for that reason alone. I'm sitting here moving through it right now and getting really sad seeing that there's nothing popping up. Oh wait, there was some in Eastern New Mexico there. Maybe we'll take a look at that in a bit. And so, you know, this is a great, tool for that for a quick look to see if there's something that's interesting coming up that you need to be watching out for. Another graphic that I love that I think everybody should have in their rotation especially that was a pun if everybody should have in their rotation is the surface base cape uh, with the wind shear with the winds all overlaid on top of that you have the surface winds 850s and the 500s I love this map so much and I think everybody should have it as part of their repertoire. You can see here the, uh, the wind barbs, the red is the surface, the black is the 500s, and the blues are the 850s. Uh, if you know anything about wind shear, which you probably should if you've been watching our channel for a while, but if you don't, there's a link right there. Uh, there's so much, uh, there's so much here, uh, so much data here that would be useful for a severe weather setup. So definitely, this is one that should be in your rotation at all times. Now, the last model product that I wanna talk about, I, I could do this all day long, and I truly mean all day long. It's the 500 millibar height anomaly on the ensembles. If you're looking for good, favorable weather patterns and the distance, you want you want to check this out. You're going to need to know a little bit about jet stream dynamics. You got to know that troughs are good for severe weather, ridges are not. Uh, on a map like this, red means ridge, blue means trough. That's the basic way to put it. And you can uh, just basically look out several days and weeks in the future and see if there is something coming up that you need to be watching. Uh, we just looked at the uh, GFS and went through and saw no supercell composite, but the GEFS is telling us there's some troughing coming in in the Western US, which is what storm chasers look for. Maybe by the time I have this video out, I'll have storm chased, maybe. So this one I love just uh, for a quick glance to kind of see, then I'll go in deeper if I see something interesting, but this is just kind of how I move through and look at the pattern coming up in a very quick way. So I don't want to go through this modeling video without having a brief conversation about soundings. Listen, folks, we're going to have real talk really quick. First off, soundings on pivotal weather are used with the, are, are done with the Sharpie uh, sounding protocol. Just amazing. Uh, but a couple of things you need to know when you're going for soundings and you're on a high res model and you click inside of a storm, that data is contaminated. Look at this. You see these red lines right here? That's a highly contaminated sounding. Throw it out. You don't know if that's, that's just not it. So when you're looking for soundings, make sure that you're fine. You're pulling them from clear air. Uh, in this case, I'm going to pull them from ahead of the storms because that's the environment these storms are moving into. And you take a look and you can see uh, there's the environment. That's what the storms are moving into. That's actually some pretty good shear. So you want to make sure that you're pulling soundings from clear air and not where storms are. Another thing that I personally believe in, and there's differences of opinion here, I'm sure, uh, would be 
two pull box soundings. Now you have to be a Pivotal Weather Plus subscriber to have these, but box soundings are even better because they're even less prone to contamination because you're kind of taking an average, just click and drag and bam, there it is. And you can see it pop up and you got a, I think a more accurate view of the atmosphere in that area. I think point soundings are, <sighs> I don't even know how to describe it. I just think that they're a little bit more unreliable than a box sounding. So just box soundings are where it's at in my opinion. That's what I use. I would recommend you use them too. So let's talk some practical tips for using weather models. There's a few things that you should take away from this. It, again, this is for beginner intermediate folks. So I think these lessons are important for anybody just starting out to hear. First off, models are models. They're not forecasts. They're not guaranteed to happen. Weather models show all kinds of really weird stuff at times. You have to be skilled. You have to think about, think about the atmosphere in terms of uh, three-dimensional. You also have to think about models in terms of this is just one run of one model. There are many models. There are many runs of those models. Take several, look at trends. Don't take any one run as the absolute gospel truth it's not going to happen. Not going to happen how models say almost always. There's always going to be something weird, interesting, unique that you did not expect to happen. Another thing that you need to know is that you don't need to overuse models. There are so many other tools when you're forecasting the weather, when you're wanting to know what's going to happen. First off, there's observational data, satellite, surface data, radar. That might be a lot better when storms are ongoing and threatening your area. Warning information, really great. There's so much information out there that is not weather models that you can use to stay informed and stay ahead of storms or to make your own forecast. Just so you know, do not discount those. And lastly, while I don't have the time to put this into this video because we don't want this video to be 50 minutes long, all models have biases. So, you know, like one example is the HRRR has this really big tendency to mix out the atmosphere, which is to make the surface temperature hotter and the dew point lower. You see it over and over again, especially on dry land days. And when you know that, and you see what it's doing, you can still, you, you can factor that in to your forecast a little bit. But again, that's why weather models should not be taken literally because they all have biases. They all do things that are not going to happen and it may affect their output. Several times this year, the HRRR mixed down and convected storms that just weren't never going to be there because the cap was so strong. So you, also, you just have to keep in mind, all models have biases, so make sure when you are uh, working through them that you're keeping those in mind. There's plenty of resources out there to learn about those. And maybe, just maybe, <sighs> I'm committing myself to so many videos, but I'll try to maybe try to do something on those eventually. So folks, that's it. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Very quick walkthrough that was of Pivotal Weather. I hope you learned something. If you really like this video, there's a lot more. Check out our weather models playlist. There's a lot of information about the different types of models, how they work, uh, different ways to assess sounding data. It's, it's all there. Just trust me, go check it out. Also, subscribe to this channel. We want you to subscribe. Please subscribe, please, because there's so much coming and I am really excited to get it to your screens. And lastly, remember, you're starting on the journey of learning weather. Weather is for everybody. That includes you, and we will see you next time.